really hope you like this video. Just subscribe, like, and click the bell to be notified of more content just like this. Wendy Diamond's with us from New York with new lighting. You would never Woo believe she was, she was in bed no more than 15 I, minutes I ago. Never. I, was up, I always have two cups of coffee. I wake up at 6 a.m. and the first hour I get to re, yep, exactly. Well, you went out to get coffee. I don't go out to get coffee. We're allowed, we're allowed. Just that's the only thing we're allowed to do now. Oh, wow. So come on, just tell us, tell us briefly. So we, we're getting locked down. My name's yeah. Rob, by the way, lovely to meet you. you um, um, we're getting locked down totally. What's it like there? What's it like in New York? Are you allowed out? Can you go to restaurants? What can you do? Well, you know, we were, the, you know, like the first place that really had a lot of COVID cases, right? So we were just, you know, in lockdown early on. So we all learned how to live and we don't go out without masks. Like there's no way, right? Yeah. And I have to say it was really, you know, when you were in New York City at the beginning of this, I would walk my, I have a dog and I would walk my dog. And every time I would walk my dog, there were, you know, ambulances with hazmat suits going in and getting people. It was, you know, you saw the big ship, the nursing ship, you know, on the water. And you just, yeah. you were just inundated about all the news of the death, you know, the trucks with all the people who were dead that they were piling up and everything. So, you know, for us, I think living here right now is probably the most surreal time because everything that we are in New York City for is no longer here, right? It's about the people, it's about the places, it's 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 just the culture, right? Which we no longer have. But you know, New York is resilient and the people are resilient. And so for me, I'm from a little town in Ohio, so it's like being in the country of England, you know what I mean? Like just total little town. So I'm a kid in a candy land here. You know, I love it, I'm embracing it. You know, I go to the park all the time. We have a yoga class in the park and not now because it's cold, but you know, we set it up in this big, beautiful loft. So we're, you know, we're creating our own new normal here in a socially distant way. Don't you think though, don't you think we're living? I was speaking to, I was speaking to my daughter the other day and she said, dad, do you think, do you think, you know, when people look back in 20 years, they'll go, gosh, did, did you live, did you live through, well, I hope we all live through that, but you live through that. Bear in mind, you've got, you've got one of the biggest, the most momentous presidential elections coming up with a country that, that Woo! is, you know, I mean, oh, a world, I mean, a world that is possible. I mean, what a time to be living in. Well, I agree. I agree. I agree. And that's why we should all embrace this time. For the first time in history, we all have time, the greatest asset, mm -hmm. right? And so what are the things that you've always wanted to do? What if you always wanted to learn? And luckily now, like everybody online, whether it's Khan Academy or Harvard or Coursera or whatever that might be, are allowing people to learn for free. And that's the best thing you can do because really it's, you know, if we really start thinking about what's happening, you know, we could go crazy, right? Who doesn't have, who, maybe Jeff Bezos is the only person that didn't have mental health issues during this time, but. He's loving it. They're doing great. He's fine. Between... Jeff's fine in this time. He's doing great. <laughs> but there's a difference office. between be mental better. health. Exactly. There's a difference between mental health and mentally ill, right? And, you know, how do we look at this time and say, you know, what can we do? You know, what have we always wanted to do? and really, you know, focus on the positive because, you know, if you just focus on what's going on, you're going to be depressed. So it's really important to find things that you're really passionate about and how you can contribute to making this world a better place. But, but you're, you're one of the most, I've been watching all your stuff this morning. I feel like, I feel like, you know, I've seen I've, and the, the way you come across your passion, your energy. How do you focus though? Because you, you look like you, you strike me as somebody with a million ideas flying here and there. And a, how, how do you sort of set yourself down and go, right, Wendy, I've got to do this today. Well, okay, so so I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. No one would ever hire me, right? So I've always had to have, you know, figure out what to do and how to do it and be creative, right? And I never do anything that doesn't make a difference in this world. So I, you know, so for me, inside of me, whether it was creating Animal Fair Media when I learned 12 million animals were euthanized here and nobody was talking about adoption or rescue, I had a passion to do that. So it didn't matter what was going on at the time. And let me tell you, breeders and, and like the age, AKC and all those people were after me, right? But I kept going because I had that, you know, inner in, inner piece of like, wow, if I could help these 12 million animals being euthanized here in 1999, you know, we could change the world. That number's now down to 2 million. And like Forbes and Vanity Fair and New York Times and everybody during that time credited us with bringing celebrities and pop culture to the animal rescue world, right? And then in, um, you know, I, I had a crazy stalker, which kind of ruined my life. And I read about uh, that. You know, so in 2013. <laughs> 
That's so a, bad. We're glad well, that was actually back now. We're glad you're safe and well. That's a good exactly. thing. Exactly. Well, it was a woman, so don't worry. And so, like, so anyway, <laughs> so anyway, so fast forward, you know, everything we go through in life is a positive, right? Whether we know it in a day, a year, 20 years from now. And that's what you just have to think about when you're going through things like what we're dealing with now, right? And just realize there's something that we're learning from this that's going to make us a better person. And, and so, you know, kind of going back to my stalker, you know, if it wasn't for my stalker, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. And I'm so grateful to her. Like, literally, I ended up in Honduras on vacation, not realizing it was the murder capital of the world. I'm like, what am I doing here? Oh, you'll love this, by the way. I was at a boutique hotel in the jungle in Honduras, the murder capital of the world. And at this boutique hotel, there was only British people who loved birds. And they would risk their lives to watch these rare birds in Honduras. After two days with them, I thought I was going to go cuckoo. And I literally ended up volunteering for an organization that gives microloans to poor women. And that's what I, you know, wow, that inspired me to create Women's Entrepreneurship Day organization uh, that we're in 144 countries right now. And that's what led me to doing that. Tell me, tell me, will it, will, will it go? It's, it's November, isn't it? November sort of. November it, 19th. It's an official 19th. day. What's going to happen? Will it will it be a Zoom? Uh, well, so you know, you know, you know, we're more advanced. You know, we're a little more advanced here in America. So the House of Representatives and Governor Cuomo, and you know, we're huge in Africa. You know, countries like Europe and like you know, you guys are a little bit more like ah, oh, we don't need the help. But this is really about from a ground up approach. Okay. To bring awareness towards the importance of empowering women in business, because when you look at like when I realized um, with the microloans of these poor women in Honduras. When they earned money, 90% of that money went to educate their children and provide for those families, right? Giving an education to a child enables them to think what they can do in life, right? And be able to dream. And the key, what I was, you know, going through all the statistics at the time when I was creating Women's Entrepreneurship Day is, you know, when women are empowered in business, they have self-confidence and dignity. They don't allow human rights violations, right? And so, and 1% at the time when I launched it in 2013, 1% of venture dollars went towards women founders, you know, so all the statistics were like, whoa, we really need to create a simplified movement. So we just partnered with Bartle Bogle Hegarty, and she's from England, the chairwoman, her name's Sarah Watson. And so we're going to be launching also on December 2nd, Choose Women. So if you go to choosewomen.org, you'll see Brilliant. what we're doing. And it's basically saying, because in America, we have Giving Tuesday, which you also have in the UK, oh. and you have Small Business Saturday, and you have Black Friday and all this other stuff. We're going to take the Wednesday and say, hey, choose women. What woman inspired you? And you better be posting too, Rob. And what, well, woman, what woman do you choose that inspired you? And that's and that's, you know, so these are the projects that I'm working on during COVID, like 24 hours a day. And then, of course, the first day of isolation, I started a new company. And so I've just started, I'm now a new entrepreneur working on a new project. Um, so on the first day of isolation in 2013, when I decided to launch Women's Entrepreneurship Day organization, one of the reasons I started it was because I learned a really important statistic at the time was 250 million girls were living in poverty. And that year in all the news, all you heard about was like Tinder, Tinder, Tinder and matching and all this stuff, right? And I thought to myself in 2013, my gosh, if we could create an app like Tinder for mentors and give each of those 250 million girls a mentor, we could change the world. And wow. so on the first day of isolation, literally, I had a, I had a British um, intern named Phoebe, if she, uh, you should send her this. And she, I looked at her and I said, oh my God, the UK. And she, I said, you know, I had a dream in 2013 to create an app. I will never have this time again. And if I don't do it, I'll I will just regret it for the rest of my life, right? So that's when I launched Be My Mentor. And so I'm, I've now gone on a six month journey to create an app and ecosystem to enable everyone in the world a free mentor. Listen, I, I, I have three daughters uh, who I love right. dearly um, at different ages. Um, you choose woman thing, sounds like something my 13 year old would come home and say, <clears throat> dad, we've got the homework, choose women, which I think is brilliant. I mean, that, it, 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 to put it into the education system that over here certainly would be sensational. Well, I think it's simple, right? When you think about, 
the world, right? Everyone is, you know, not 98% of the world is struggling, right? They're like, how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to put my kids through school? How am I going to put food on the table, right? It's just so complicated life, right? So how do you find a simple thing that everyone can understand? And that's what Choose Women is, is basically saying, why are, you know, who, what woman do you choose that inspired you? Whether it's a woman in politics, woman in business, woman in art, women in finance. When you look at the statistics, they're all that, you know, women are, are the underdog, right? They're underfunded, they're underrepresented, you know, in all aspects of life. So how do we create a movement to enable your daughter to be able to dream and have, you know, and know that she can be anything she wants to be in this world? Fantastic. Listen, I know, I know because you're the busiest woman in the world. No, I'm um, not. By the way, I always have time. Always have time. That's Busy what we love about you. People can always you. find time. Listen, I want it now. Listen, this, this is the big question. Okay. Okay. We've just moved as a family from the Middle East. We were in the Middle East for 11 years. So we've what just... Part? Pardon? Which part? I was in Dubai. Okay. Okay. But I was working across the Middle East, various television stations and, and, and what have you. Okay. So the deal was, when we come back to England, we've got to get a dog. Yay! Okay? We've got to get a dog. Now, there's two things. One, my big daughter is studying veterinary medicine at university. So she's animal, loves animals to bits. Right. My wife is currently doing a dog grooming course. Now, the bad thing about that is she practices on my hair. <laughs> You see, and you, you can tell. Get her. You look pretty good. You can tell. And so my 13-year-old is like, now they want they want a rescue dog. So tell us about just the just from your background, one animal shelters, animal welfare. You said 12 million dogs euthanasia. And that also was in 1999 when I started. That was in 1999, two million yeah. now. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. We're all over it. What dog do you recommend for us? Okay. Family. Now what would you here's the deal. Here's the deal, you know, my whole thing is adoption. Yeah. And my whole deal is, you know, it's like anything- Or fostering as well. Well, if, you know, it's definitely fostering is a good opportunity for you and the family to see whether that dog fits with your family, yeah. right? But I think the most important thing is to look at your lifestyle. Do you want a puppy that needs a lot of exercise and can you take them around everywhere, right? Do you want a senior dog that's going to be more relaxed to be at your home? Do you want a dog that, you know, barks a lot and that's fun and crazy, you know, and, and there's different ways. So it's important for you as a family to do your research on what breed fits you. But I can guarantee you whatever breed that is, you can find one up for adoption. Yeah. The other thing that strikes me is that what you initially came across with animal fare and things like that, which you brought into the consciousness, which, which you're quite right now, you cannot look at Instagram. You cannot switch the television on without. And when, I started, when I started animal fare, there were no animals in commercials. What? Nobody. No, there were no animals. No celebrity was carrying an animal in a magazine yeah. or anything. Right. And that. The, you know, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. My, yeah, my apologies. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just say that the thing that you stumble across in is people. People of all walks of life love love animals. Well, I you mean, know, here's they the love thing. them. I, I went they to the shelter more now because of you. Well, because when I went to the city shelter in New York, right, I was able to adopt a purebred Russian blue cat and a purebred Maltese, and I realized, wow, if you could adopt any breed, any size, any age, any color. You know, why would somebody ever want to buy a dog when they could adopt and save a life, right? By, by simplifying that, because it's all about simplifying, because everyone in the world wants to help. You just have to make it really easy for them. And that's just been my mindset from coming from a small town, just to understand, you know, I'm like a country bumpkin, you know, and I live in New York City now, and it's like, ah, and it's, you know, and I just think, you know, really, you know, if we can just create ways for people to really understand in a simple way, they will support and they will help. And that's the key to like, you know, whether I was helping homeless people or homeless animals or poor women, is just about creating these really easy ways for people to contribute to make this world a positive place. I, 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 I did look at your Instagram and one of the pictures that stood out for me, because he's my hero and he was my hero growing up, was, was an unbelievable picture you had with Muhammad Ali, obviously before, before he died. Um, uh, what are the people that you've met in your w different walks of life that one have surprised you perhaps or two have most impressed you? Wow. Okay. 
I mean, you know, when you think about it, it's never a celebrity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always the people you never heard of that are not looking for attention. Yes. Right. I mean, so I would say just in, in my life, the people that I think, you know, really made a little impact in whatever I've thought and have done and stuff like that would be a woman named Lak Shalart, who has the elephant sanctuary in Thailand, who takes all the abused elephants and, wow. and lets them live free, you know, in, outside of Chiang Mai. And just people that are around the world that are working on things, you know, there's a woman in Sri Lanka that's saving all the animals and every day she's out there and she's literally saved, you know, hundreds of thousands of animals in um, Sri Lanka. And these are people to me that are like really making a difference. They're not looking for publicity. They're not looking for fame. They're not looking for power. You know, they're really doing it because of what they really care about and they're passionate about. So those are pretty much more the people I'm... I, I also read that um, after your stalker and you went to Honduras and you said, I'm going to go to two countries a year. That's what that's what I want to do. One, obviously, with with restrictions now with COVID makes it difficult. <laughs> which which countries have you enjoyed? Uh, which countries have you have you been surprised about? Uh, which countries have you gone? Oh, I'm not going back there. Um, I love everywhere. Like I said, there's always something positive about everywhere. Right. And you learn yeah. and. You know, being, you know, just growing up in America, I wasn't, you know, it just, I, and being open to the world, I find the best thing you can do is travel. So I, you know, it's like right now, what are we doing, right? Um, so one of my favorite places in the world is Guatemala. Uh-huh. And it's, it, it is such a unique country in, South, in Central America. First of all, it's inexpensive. They have a 16th century town called Antigua. Every little hotel is beautiful and renovated and has a little pool inside and so forth. And then there's this one place called Lake Atitlan. And Lake Atitlan has no cars and it's surrounded by three volcanoes. And it's the most peaceful place I've ever been to on wow. Earth. And Brilliant. for 50 US dollars, you can stay at a gorgeous, gorgeous, like little boutique hotel on the lake. If you Google it, Google Lake Aditlan, you know, on the lake, you will, you will be mesmerized by like feeling you've just reached heaven. It is so beautiful. The problem with that though, is you see the problem with all these travel, you've just now, there will be now 25 billion tourists from all that, once they see this, going to that so. lovely lake. Needs our those high rise Guatemala hotels and things house. like that. So, so I, you know, I love, <laughs> I love developing countries, right? I love countries and I love the people that are just working hard to help their countries. Um, another place I, I, I will always remember is Rwanda. Uh -huh. And, you know, after the genocide and so forth, they've been blessed with one of the most amazing, natural, like, woo, I, the gorillas. And literally to go to the mountains of Rwanda and personally be five feet from the gorillas is one of the most cherished memories I'll ever have. Don't you think, don't you find, and I've certainly found it as a, as a, a TV journalist, is when you go into places, people go, oh, don't go there. It's, oh no, it's terrible. And, and when you get there, you go, oh my God, the people are lovely here. The place is absolutely fantastic. I mean, you see the Middle East, the, the, the Western view of the Middle East is so, uh, people that, you know, the, that we met over there, you go, hang on, what? I, no, we're here. It's, you know, Iran's not like that. You know, it does, Kuwait's not like it. It's when you get there, you, people are people I find. Well, I 100% agree with you. Like, so if I didn't, you know, when I learned that Honduras was the murder capital of the world, you know, ever no one would go with me. No one would go with me. And oh, I was no. like, but I believe, you know, so I did my research and all the Columbia drug lords moved to Honduras, right? So that's why it became with the drugs, but I'm not doing, I've never done drugs and I'll never do drugs and I'll never hang out with drug people and I'll never be in those areas. And I feel like, you know, especially also, you know, during the time when I went to Rwanda, I went to Uganda as well right? Because I do two countries. So I try to find them right next to each other. And um, so I went to Uganda as well. And, you know, the U.S. State Department was like, do not travel there. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, definitely I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an adventurer and I love life and I'm, I, you know, I will not allow, you know, anything to stop me from seeing what I want to see and doing what I want to do and, and everything, you know. And so I think, you know, when you're looking at traveling, I think you have to just, you know, make a choice, right? And do your research on why, right? And I think, you know, we should all be able to explore. And I think we should all be able to, you know, want to see the places we want to see.
And so I think, you know, I, I definitely feel like, you know, the news media focuses on the negative. You yes. know, you never see like I, nice things out of the news. Oh, look at this nice person doing this nice thing. It's always, yeah. it's always like people, I guess, are now with their minds are like, they want to see the bad or something. I don't, but like, they want to see the bad, right? But like, if you really look into it, it's always like this one little section, right? And so forth. Um, uh, last one for you. Uh, in England, if you're a nice person or a really good person or people like you, they go, do you know what? She's a diamond. Ah! That's what they say. That's what they say. So your name's perfect. Is that she's true? Wendy. Wendy, she's a diamond. Oh, that's so funny. Well, that's fun. Is that like a long time ago? Where did that come from? It's, it's a slap. They go, if somebody's nice or they really good person, go, ah, oh, he or she, they go, she's a diamond. As in, she's a fantastic person. So Wendy that's Diamond. Your last name. Wendy Diamond, you know what? What? Thanks. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lovely seeing you. Take care, Wendy. Woohoo! Bye. Bye bye.